Another psychological weakness on which to construct a smoke screen is the tendency to mistake appearances for reality, the feeling that if someone seems to belong to your group, their belonging must be real. This habit makes the seamless blend a very effective front. The trick is simple, you simply blend in with those around you. The better you blend, the less suspicious you become. During the Cold War of the 1950s and 60s, as is now notorious, a slew of British civil servants passed secrets to the Soviets. They went undetected for years because they were apparently decent chaps, had gone to all the right schools, and fit the old boy network perfectly. Blending in is the perfect smoke screen for spying. The better you do it, the better you can conceal your intentions. Remember, it takes patience and humility to dull your brilliant colors, to put on the mask of the inconspicuous. Do not despair at having to wear such a bland mask. It is often your unreadability that draws people to you and makes you appear a person of power. Image, a sheepskin. A sheep never marauds. A sheep never deceives. A sheep is magnificently dumb and docile. With a sheep skin on his back, a fox can pass right into the chicken coop. Authority. Have you ever heard of a skillful general, who intends to surprise a citadel, announcing his plan to his enemy? Conceal your purpose and hide your progress. Do not disclose the extent of your designs until they cannot be opposed, until the combat is over. Win the victory before you declare the war. In a word, imitate those warlike people whose designs are not known except by the ravaged country through which they have passed. Nin and Dullen Close. 1623 to 1706 reversal no smoke screen red herring false sincerity or any other diversionary device will succeed in concealing your intentions if you already have an established reputation for deception and as you get older and achieve success it often becomes increasingly difficult to disguise your cunning everyone knows you practice deception persist in playing naive and you run the risk of seeming the rankest hypocrite which will severely limit your room to maneuver. In such cases it is better to own up, to appear the honest rogue, or, better, the repentant rogue. Not only will you be admired for your frankness, but, most wonderful and strange of all, you will be able to continue your stratagems. As P. T. Barnum, the 19th century king of Humbuggery, grew older, he learned to embrace his reputation as a grand deceiver. At one point he organized a buffalo hunt in New Jersey, complete with Indians and a few imported buffalo. He publicized the hunt as genuine, but it came off as so completely fake that the crowd, instead of getting angry and asking for their money back, was greatly amused. They knew Barnum pulled tricks all the time. That was the secret of his success, and they loved him for it. Learning a lesson from this affair, Barnum stopped concealing all of his devices, even revealing his deceptions in a tell-all autobiography. As Kierkegaard wrote, the world wants to be deceived. Finally, although it is wiser to divert attention from your purposes by presenting a bland, familiar exterior, there are times when the colorful, conspicuous gesture is the right diversionary tactic. The great charlatan mountebanks of 17th and 18th century Europe used humor and entertainment to deceive their audiences. Dazzled by a great show, the public would not notice the charlatan's real intentions. Thus the star charlatan himself would appear in town in a night black coach drawn by black horses. Clowns, tightrope walkers, and star entertainers would accompany him, pulling people into his demonstrations of elixirs and quack potions. The charlatan made entertainment seem like the business of the day. The business of the day was actually the sale of the elixirs and quack potions. Spectacle and entertainment, clearly, are excellent devices to conceal your intentions, but they cannot be used indefinitely. The public grows tired and suspicious, and eventually catches onto the trick. And indeed the charlatans had to move quickly from them from town to town, before word spread that the potions were useless and the entertainment a trick. Powerful people with bland exteriors, on the other hand the Talleyrands, the Rothschilds, the Selassies can practice their deceptions in the same place throughout their lifetimes. Their act never wears thin, and rarely causes suspicion. The colorful smoke screen should be used cautiously, then, and only when the occasion is right. Lawful. Always say less than necessary. Judgment. When you are trying to impress people with words, the more you say, the more common you appear, and the less in control. Even if you are saying something banal, it will seem original if you make it vague, open-ended, and sphinx-like. Powerful people impress and intimidate by saying less. The more you say, the more likely you are to say something foolish. Transgression of the law. Nahius Marcius 
also known as Coriolanus, was a great military hero of ancient Rome in the first half of the 5th century BC. He won many important battles, saving the city from calamity time and time again because he spent most of his time on the battlefield. Few Romans knew him personally, making him something of a legendary figure. In 454 BC, Coriolanus decided it was time to exploit his reputation and enter politics. He stood for election to the high rank of consul. Candidates for this position traditionally made a public address early in the race, and when Coriolanus came before the people, he began by displaying the dozens of scars he had accumulated over 17 years of fighting for Rome. Few in the crowd really heard the lengthy speech that followed. Those scars, proof of his valor and patriotism, moved the people to tears. Coriolanus's election seemed certain. When the polling day arrived, however, Coriolanus made an entry into the forum escorted by the entire Senate and by the city's patricians, the aristocracy. The common people who saw this were disturbed by such a blustering show of confidence on election day. And then a Coriolanus spoke again, mostly addressing the wealthy citizens who had accompanied him. His words were arrogant and insolent, claiming certain victory in the vote. He boasted of his battlefield exploits, made sour jokes that appealed only to the patricians, voiced angry accusations against his opponents, and speculated on the riches he would bring to Rome. This time the people listened, they had not realized that this legendary soldier was also a common braggart. Down on his luck, the screenwriter Michael Arlen went to New York in 1944. To drown his sorrows he paid a visit to the famous restaurant 21. In the lobby, he ran into Sam Goldwyn, who offered the somewhat impractical advice that he should buy racehorses. At the bar Arlen met Louis B. Mayer, an old acquaintance, who asked him what were his plans for the future. I was just talking to Sam Goldwyn began Arlen. How much did he offer you? Interrupted Mayer. Not enough, he replied evasively. Would you take 15,000 for 30 weeks? Asked Mayer. No hesitation this time. Yes, said Arlen. The Little, Brown Book of Anecdotes, Clifton Fadiman, ed. 1985 News of Coriolanus's second speech spread quickly through Rome, and the people turned out in great numbers to make sure he was not elected. Defeated, Coriolanus returned to the battlefield bitter and vowing revenge on the common folk who had voted against him. Some weeks later a large shipment of grain arrived in Rome. The Senate was ready to distribute this food to the people, for free, but just as they were preparing to vote on the question Coriolanus appeared on the scene and took the Senate floor. The distribution, he argued, would have a harmful effect on the city as a whole. Several senators appeared won over, and the vote on the distribution fell into doubt. Coriolanus did not stop there, he went on to condemn the concept of democracy itself. He advocated getting rid of the people's representatives, the tribunes, and turning over the governing of the city to the patricians. One of told tale about Kissinger involved a report that Winston Lord had worked on for days. After giving it to Kissinger, he got it back with a notation. Is this the best you can do? Lord rewrote and polished and finally resubmitted it. Back it came with the same curt question. After redrafting it one more time and once again getting the same question from Kissinger, Lord snapped, Damn it, yes, it's the best I can do. To which Kissinger replied, Fine, then I guess I'll read it this time. Kissinger, Walter Isaacson, 1992 When word of Coriolanus's latest speech reached the people, their anger knew no bounds. The tribunes were sent to the Senate to demand that Coriolanus appear before them. He refused. Riots broke out all over the city. The Senate, fearing the people's wrath, finally voted in favor of the grain distribution. The tribunes were appeased, but the people still demanded that Coriolanus speak to them and apologize. If he repented, and agreed to keep his opinions to himself, he would be allowed to return to the battlefield. Coriolanus did appear one last time before the people, who listened to him in rapt silence. He started slowly and softly, but as the speech went on, he became more and more blunt. Yet again he hurled insults. His tone was arrogant, his expression disdainful. The more he spoke, the angrier the people became. Finally they shouted him down and silenced him. The tribunes conferred, condemned Coriolanus to death, and ordered the magistrates to take him at once to the top of the Tarpeian rock and throw him over. The delighted crowd seconded the decision. The patricians, however, managed to intervene, and the sentence was commuted to a lifelong banishment. When the people found out that Rome's great military hero would never return to the city, 
they celebrated in the streets. In fact, no one had ever seen such a celebration, not even after the defeat of a foreign enemy. Interpretation Before his entrance into politics, the name of Coriolanus evoked all. His battlefield accomplishments showed him as a man of great bravery. Since the citizens knew little about him, all kinds of legends became attached to his name. The moment he appeared before the Roman citizens, however, and spoke his mind, all that grandeur and mystery vanished. He bragged and blustered like a common soldier. He insulted and slandered people, as if he felt threatened and insecure. Suddenly he was not at all what the people had imagined. The discrepancy between the legend and the reality proved immensely disappointing to those who wanted to believe in their hero. The more Coriolanus said, the less powerful he appeared. A person who cannot control his words shows that he cannot control himself and is unworthy of respect. The king, Louis XIV maintains the most impenetrable secrecy about affairs of state. The ministers attend council meetings, but he confides his plans to them only when he has reflected at length upon them and has come to a definite decision. I wish you might see the king. His expression is inscrutable. His eyes like those of a fox. He never discusses state affairs except with his ministers in council. When he speaks to courtiers he refers only to their respective prerogatives or duties. Even the most frivolous of his utterances has the air of being the pronouncement of an oracle. Me Visconti, quoted in Louis XIV, Louis Bertrand, 1928 had Coriolanus said less, the people would never have had cause to be offended by him, would never have known his true feelings. He would have maintained his powerful aura, would certainly have been elected consul, and would have been able to accomplish his anti-democratic goals. But the human tongue is a beast that few can master. It strains constantly to break out of its cage, and if it is not tamed, it will run wild and cause you grief. Power cannot accrue to those who squander their treasure of words. Oysters open completely when the moon is full. And when the crab sees one it throws a piece of stone or seaweed into it and the oyster cannot close again so that it serves the crab for meat. Such is the fate of him who opens his mouth too much and thereby puts himself at the mercy of the listener. Leonardo da Vinci, 1452-1519 Observance of the Law In the court of Louis XIV, nobles and ministers would spend days and nights debating issues of state. They would confer, argue, make and break alliances, and argue again, until finally the critical moment arrived, two of them would be chosen to represent the different sides to Louis himself, who would decide what should be done. After these persons were chosen, everyone would argue some more, how should the issues be phrased? What would appeal to Louis? What would annoy him? At what time of day should the representatives approach him, and in what part of the Versailles Palace? What expression should they have on their faces? Finally, after all this was settled, the fateful moment would finally arrive. The two men would approach Louis always a delicate matter and when they finally had his ear, they would talk about the issue at hand, spelling out the options in detail. Louis would listen in silence, a most enigmatic look on his face. Finally, when each had finished his presentation and had asked for the king's opinion, he would look at them both and say, I shall see. Then he would walk away. The ministers and courtiers would never hear another word on the subject from the king. They would simply see the result, weeks later, when he would come to a decision and act. He would never bother to consult them on the matter again. Undutiful words of a subject do often take deeper root than the memory of ill deeds. The late Earl of Essex told Queen Elizabeth that her conditions were as crooked as her carcass. But it cost him his head, which his insurrection had not cost him but for that speech. Sir Walter Raleigh. 1554-1618 Interpretation Louis XIV was a man of very few words. His most famous remark is lit at, kissed moi, I am the state. Nothing could be more pithy yet more eloquent. His infamous I shall see was one of several extremely short phrases that he would apply to all manner of requests. Louis was not always this way. As a young man he was known for talking at length, delighting in his own eloquence. His later taciturnity was self-imposed, an act a mask he used to keep everybody below him off balance. No one knew exactly where he stood, or could predict his reactions. No one could try to deceive him by saying what they thought he wanted to hear, because no one knew what he wanted to hear. As they talked on and on to the silent Louis, they revealed more and more about themselves, information he would later use against them to great effect. In the end, Louis's silence kept those around him terrified and under his thumb. It was one of the foundations of his power. As Saint Simon wrote, no one knew as well as he how to sell his words, his smile, even his glances. Everything in him was valuable because he created differences, 
and his majesty was enhanced by the sparseness of his words. It is even more damaging for a minister to say foolish things than to do them. Cardinal de Retz, 1613 to 1679. Keys to power. Power is in many ways a game of appearances, and when you say less than necessary, you inevitably appear greater and more powerful than you are. Your silence will make other people uncomfortable. Humans are machines of interpretation and explanation. They have to know what you are thinking. When you carefully control what you reveal, they cannot pierce your intentions or your meaning. Your short answers and silences will put them on the defensive, and they will jump in, nervously filling the silence with all kinds of comments that will reveal valuable information about them and their weaknesses. They will leave a meeting with you feeling as if they had been robbed, and they will go home and ponder your every word. This extra attention to your brief comments will only add to your power. Saying less than necessary is not for kings and statesmen only. In most areas of life, the less you say, the more profound and mysterious you appear. As a young man, the artist Andy Warhol had the revelation that it was generally impossible to get people to do what you wanted them to do by talking to them. They would turn against you, subvert your wishes, disobey you out of sheer perversity. He once told a friend, I learned that you actually have more power when you shut up. In his later life Warhol employed this strategy with great success. His interviews were exercises in oracular speech. He would say something vague and ambiguous, and the interviewer would twist in circles trying to figure it out, imagining there was something profound behind his often meaningless phrases. Warhol rarely talked about his work. He let others do the interpreting. He claimed to have learned this technique from that master of enigma Marcel Duchamp, another 20th century artist who realized early on that the less he said about his work, the more people talked about it, and the more they talked, the more valuable his work became. By saying less than necessary you create the appearance of meaning and power. Also, the less you say, the less risk you run of saying something foolish, even dangerous. In 1825 a new Tsar, Nicholas I, ascended the throne of Russia. A rebellion immediately broke out, led by liberals demanding that the country modernize that its industries and civil structures catch up with the rest of Europe. Brutally crashing this rebellion, the Decembrist uprising, Nicholas I sentenced one of its leaders, Kondraty Rylayev, to death. On the day of the execution Rylayev stood on the gallows, the noose around his neck. The trapdoor opened but as Rylayev dangled, the rope broke, dashing him to the ground. At the time, events like this were considered signs of providence or heavenly will, and a man saved from execution this way was usually pardoned. As Rylayev got to his feet, Bruised and dirtied but believing his neck had been saved, he called out to the crowd, You see, in Russia they don't know how to do anything properly, not even how to make rope. A messenger immediately went to the Winter Palace with news of the failed hanging. Vexed by this disappointing turnabout, Nicholas I nevertheless began to sign the pardon. But then, did Rylayev say anything after this miracle? The Tsar asked the messenger. Sire, the messenger replied, he said that in Russia they don't even know how to make rope. In that case, said the Tsar, let us prove the contrary, and he tore up the pardon. The next day Rylayev was hanged again. This time the rope did not break. Learn the lesson, once the words are out, you cannot take them back. Keep them under control. Be particularly careful with sarcasm. The momentary satisfaction you gain with your biting words will be outweighed by the price you pay. Image. The Oracle of Delphi. When visitors consulted the Oracle, the priestess would utter a few enigmatic words that seemed full of meaning and import. No one disobeyed the words of the Oracle they held power over life and death. Authority. Never start moving your own lips and teeth before the subordinates do. The longer I keep quiet, the sooner others move their lips and teeth. As they move their lips and teeth, I can thereby understand their real intentions. If the sovereign is not mysterious, the ministers will find opportunity to take and take. Han Fei Zhu, Chinese philosopher, 3rd century BC. Reversal. There are times when it is unwise to be silent. Silence can arouse suspicion and even insecurity, especially in your superiors. A vague or ambiguous comment can open you up to interpretations you had not bargained for. Silence and saying less than necessary must be practiced with caution, then, and in the right situations. It is occasionally wiser to imitate the court jester, who plays the fool but knows he is smarter than the king. He talks and talks and entertains, and no one suspects that he is more than just a fool. Also, words can sometimes act as a kind of smoke screen for any deception you might practice. By bending your listener's ear with talk, 
you can distract and mesmerize them. The more you talk, in fact, the less suspicious of you they become. The verbose are not perceived as sly and manipulative but as helpless and unsophisticated. This is the reverse of the silent policy employed by the powerful, by talking more, and making yourself appear weaker and less intelligent than your mark. You can practice deception with greater ease. Law 5. So much depends on reputation guarded with your life. Judgment. Reputation is the cornerstone of power. Through reputation alone you can intimidate and win. Once it slips, however, you are vulnerable, and will be attacked on all sides. Make your reputation unassailable. Always be alert to potential attacks and thwart them before they happen. Meanwhile, learn to destroy your enemies by opening holes in their own reputations. Then stand aside and let public opinion hang them. Observance of the Law 1 During China's War of the Three Kingdoms, AD 207-265, the great general Xu Keliang, leading the forces of the Shu Kingdom, dispatched his vast army to a distant camp while he rested in a small town with a handful of soldiers. Suddenly sentinels hurried in with the alarming news that an enemy force of over 150,000 troops under Sima Yi was approaching. With only a hundred men to defend him, Xu Keliang's situation was hopeless. The enemy would finally capture this renowned leader without lamenting his fate or wasting time trying to figure out how he had been caught. Liang ordered his troops to take down their flags, throw open the city gates, and hide. He himself then took a seat on the most visible part of the city's wall, wearing a Taoist robe. He lit some incense, strummed his lute, and began to chant. Minutes later he could see the vast enemy army approaching, an endless phalanx of soldiers. Pretending not to notice them, he continued to sing and play the lute. Soon the army stood at the town gates. At its head was Sima Yi who instantly recognized the man on the wall. Even so, as his soldiers itched to enter the unguarded town through its open gates, Sima Yi hesitated, held them back, and studied Liang on the wall. Then, he ordered an immediate and speedy retreat. The animals stricken with the plague, a frightful epidemic sent to earth by heaven intent to vent its fury on a sinful world, to call it by its rightful name, the pestilence, that and filling vial of virulence had fallen on every animal. Not all were dead, but all lay near to dying, and none was any longer trying to find new fuel to feed life's flickering fires. No foods excited their desires. No more did wolves and foxes rove in search of harmless, helpless prey. And dove would not consort with dove, for love and joy had flown away. The lion assumed the chair to say, Dear friends, I doubt not it's for heaven's high ends that on us sinners woe must fall. Let him of us who sinned the most fall victim to the avenging heavenly host, and may he win salvation for us all. For history teaches us that in these crises we must make sacrifices. Undeceived and stern-eyed, let's inspect our conscience. As I recollect, to put my greedy appetite to sleep, I banqueted on many a sheep who'd injured me in no respect and even in my time been known to try shepherd pie. If need be, then I'll die. Yet I suspect that others also ought to own their sins. It's only 30 HNT all should do their best to single out the guiltiest. Sire, you're too good a king, the fox begins. Such scruples are too delicate, my word, to eat sheep, that profane and vulgar herd. That sin, nay, sire, enough for such a crew to be devoured by such as you. While of the shepherds we may say that they deserved the worst they got, there's being the lot that over us beasts plot a flimsy dream begotten sway. Thus spake the fox, and toady cheers rose high, while none dared cast too cold an eye on tigers, bears, and other eminences most unpardonable offences each, of never mind what courage breed, was really a saint, they all agreed. Then came the ass, to say, I do recall how once I crossed an apple mead where hunger, grass in plenty, and with all, I have no doubt, some imp of greed assailed me, and I shaved a tongue's breadth wide where frankly I'd no right to any grass. All forthwith fell full cry upon the ass. a wolf of some book learning testified that the cursed beast must suffer their despite, that gall-skinned author of their piteous plight. They judged him fit for naught but gallows bait, how vile, and others grass to sequestrate. His death alone could expiate a crime so heinous, as full well he learns, the court, as you're of great or poor estate, will paint you either white or black by turns. The best fables of L.A. Fontaine, Jean de L.A. Fontaine, 1621-1695. Interpretation Xiu Liang was commonly known as the Sleeping Dragon. 
His exploits in the War of the Three Kingdoms were legendary. Once a man claiming to be a disaffected enemy lieutenant came to his camp, offering help and information. Liang instantly recognized the situation as a setup. This man was a false deserter, and should be beheaded. At the last minute, though, as the axe was about to fall, Liang stopped the execution and offered to spare the man's life if he agreed to become a double agent. Grateful and terrified, the man agreed, and began supplying false information to the enemy. Liang won battle after battle. On another occasion Liang stole a military seal and created false documents dispatching his enemy's troops to distant locations. Once the troops had dispersed, he was able to capture three cities, so that he controlled an entire corridor of the enemy's kingdom. He also once tricked the enemy into believing one of its best generals was a traitor, forcing the man to escape and join forces with Liang. The sleeping dragon carefully cultivated his reputation of being the cleverest man in China, one who always had a trick up his sleeve. As powerful as any weapon, this reputation struck fear into his enemy. Sima Yi had fought against Yu Ko Liang dozens of times and knew him well. When he came on the empty city, with Liang praying on the wall, he was stunned. The Taoist robes, the chanting, the incense this had to be a game of intimidation. The man was obviously taunting him, daring him to walk into a trap. The game was so obvious that for one moment it crossed his mind that Liang actually was alone and desperate, but so great was his fear of Liang that he dared not risk finding out. Such is the power of reputation. It can put a vast army on the defensive, even force them into retreat, without a single arrow being fired. For, as Cicero says, even those who argue against fame still want the books they write against it to bear their name in the title and hope to become famous for despising it. Everything else is subject to barter, we will let our friends have our goods and our lives if need be but a case of sharing our fame and making someone else the gift of our reputation is hardly to be found. Montaigne, 1533-1592 Observance of the Law 2 In 1841 the young P. T. Barnum, trying to establish his reputation as America's premier showman, decided to purchase the American Museum in Manhattan and turn it into a collection of curiosities that would secure his fame. The problem was that he had no money. The museum's asking price was $15,000, but Barnum was able to put together a proposal that appealed to the institution's owners even though it replaced cash up front with dozens of guarantees and references. The owners came to a verbal agreement with Barnum, but at the last minute, the principal partner changed his mind, and the museum and its collection were sold to the directors of Peel's Museum. Barnum was infuriated, but the partner explained that business was business. The museum had been sold to Peel's because Peel's had a reputation and Barnum had none. Barnum immediately decided that if he had no reputation to bank on, his only recourse was to ruin the reputation of Peel's. Accordingly he launched a letter-writing campaign in the newspapers, calling the owners a bunch of broken-down bank directors who had no idea how to run a museum or entertain people. He warned the public against buying Peel's stock, since the business's purchase of another museum would invariably spread its resources thin. The campaign was effective, the stock plummeted, and with no more confidence in Peel's track record and reputation, the owners of the American Museum reneged on their deal and sold the whole thing to Barnum. It took years for Peel's to recover and they never forgot what Barnum had done. Mr. Peel himself decided to attack Barnum by building a reputation for highbrow entertainment, promoting his museum's programs as more scientific than those of his vulgar competitor. Mesmerism, hypnotism, was one of Peel's scientific attractions, and for a while it drew big crowds and was quite successful. To fight back, Barnum decided to attack Peel's reputation yet again. Barnum organized a rival mesmeric performance in which he himself apparently put a little girl into a trance. Once she seemed to have fallen deeply under, he tried to hypnotize members of the audience but no matter how hard he tried, none of the spectators fell under his spell, and many of them began to laugh. A frustrated Barnum finally announced that to prove the little girl's trance was real, he would cut off one of her fingers without her noticing, but as he sharpened the knife, the little girl's eyes popped open and she ran away, to the audience's delight. He repeated this and other parodies for several weeks. Soon no one could take Peel's show seriously, and attendance went way down. Within a few weeks, the show closed. Over the next few years Barnum established a reputation for audacity and consummate showmanship that lasted his whole life. P. 
Peel's reputation, on the other hand, never recovered. Interpretation Barnum used two different tactics to ruin Peel's reputation. The first was simple, he sowed doubts about the museum's stability and solvency. Doubt is a powerful weapon. Once you let it out of the bag with insidious rumors, your opponents are in a horrible dilemma. On the one hand they can deny the rumors, even prove that you have slandered them. But a layer of suspicion will remain. Why are they defending themselves so desperately? Maybe the rumor has some truth to it. If, on the other hand, they take the high road and ignore you, the doubts, unrefuted, will be even stronger if done correctly. The sowing of rumors can so infuriate and unsettle your rivals that in defending themselves they will make numerous mistakes. This is the perfect weapon for those who have no reputation of their own to work from. Once Barnum did have a reputation of his own, he used the second, gentler tactic, the fake hypnotism demonstration, he ridiculed his rival's reputation. This too was extremely successful. Once you have a solid base of respect, Ridiculing your opponent both puts him on the defensive and draws more attention to you, enhancing your own reputation. Outright slander and insult are too strong at this point. They are ugly, and may hurt you more than help you. But gentle barbs and mockeries suggest that you have a strong enough sense of your own worth to enjoy a good laugh at your rival's expense. A humorous front can make you out as a harmless entertainer while poking holes in the reputation of your rival. It is easier to cope with a bad conscience than with a bad reputation. Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844-1900 Keys to power The people around us, even our closest friends, will always to some extent remain mysterious and unfathomable. Their characters have secret recesses that they never reveal. The unknowableness of other people could prove disturbing if we thought about it long enough, since it would make it impossible for us really to judge other people. So we prefer to ignore this fact, and to judge people on their appearances, on what is most visible to our eyes clothes, gestures, words, actions. In the social realm, appearances are the barometer of almost all of our judgments, and you must never be misled into believing otherwise. One false slip, one awkward or sudden change in your appearance, can prove disastrous. This is the reason for the supreme importance of making and maintaining a reputation that is of your own creation. That reputation will protect you in the dangerous game of appearances, distracting the probing eyes of others from knowing what you are really like and giving you a degree of control over how the world judges you a powerful position to be in. Reputation has a power like magic. With one stroke of its wand, it can double your strength. It can also send people scurrying away from you. Whether the exact same deeds appear brilliant or dreadful can depend entirely on the reputation of the doer. In the ancient Chinese court of the Wei Kingdom there was a man named Mizua who had a reputation for supreme civility and graciousness. He became the ruler's favorite. It was a law in Wei that whoever rides secretly in the ruler's coach shall have his feet cut off. But when Mizua's mother fell ill, he used the royal coach to visit her, pretending that the ruler had given him permission. When the ruler found out, he said, How dutiful is Mizua. For his mother's sake he even forgot that he was committing a crime making him liable to lose his feet. Another time the two of them took a stroll in an orchard. Mizua began eating a peach that he could not finish, and he gave the ruler the other half to eat. The ruler remarked, you love me so much that you would even forget your own saliva taste and let me eat the rest of the peach. Later, however, envious fellow courtiers, spreading word that Mizuo was actually devious and arrogant, succeeded in damaging his reputation. The ruler came to see his actions in a new light. This fellow once rode in my coach under pretense of my order, he told the courtiers angrily, and another time he gave me a half-eaten peach. For the same actions that had charmed the ruler when he was the favorite, Mizuin now had to suffer the penalties. The fate of his feet depended solely on the strength of his reputation. In the beginning, you must work to establish a reputation for one outstanding quality, whether generosity or honesty or cunning. This quality sets you apart and gets other people to talk about you. You then make your reputation known to as many people as possible, subtly, though. Take care to build slowly, and with a firm foundation and watch as it spreads like wildfire. A solid reputation increases your presence and exaggerates your strengths without your having to spend much energy. It can also create an aura around you that will instill respect, even fear. In the fighting in the North African desert during World War II, 
The German general Erwin Rommel had a reputation for cunning and for deceptive maneuvering that struck terror into everyone who faced him, even when his forces were depleted, and when British tanks outnumbered his by five to one, entire cities would be evacuated at the news of his approach. As they say, your reputation inevitably precedes you, and if it inspires respect, a lot of your work is done for you before you arrive on this scene, or utter a single word. Your success seems destined by your past triumphs. Much of the success of Henry Kissinger's shuttle diplomacy rested on his reputation for ironing out differences. No one wanted to be seen as so unreasonable that Kissinger could not sway him. A peace treaty seemed a fait accompli as soon as Kissinger's name became involved in the negotiations. Make your reputation simple and base it on one sterling quality. This single quality efficiency, say, or seductiveness becomes a kind of calling card that announces your presence and places others under a spell. A reputation for honesty will allow you to practice all manner of deception. Casanova used his reputation as a great seducer to pave the way for his future conquests. Women who had heard of his powers became immensely curious, and wanted to discover for themselves what had made him so romantically successful. Perhaps you have already stained your reputation, so that you are prevented from establishing a new one. In such cases it is wise to associate with someone whose image counteracts your own, using their good name to whitewash and elevate yours. It is hard, for example, to erase a reputation for dishonesty by yourself. But a paragon of honesty can help when p. T. Barnum wanted to clean up a reputation for promoting vulgar entertainment, he brought the singer Jenny Lind over from Europe. She had a stellar, high-class reputation, and the American tour Barnum sponsored for her greatly enhanced his own image. Similarly the great robber barons of 19th century America were long unable to rid themselves of a reputation for cruelty and mean-spiritedness. Only when they began collecting art, so that the names of Morgan and Frick became permanently associated with those of da Vinci and Rembrandt, were they able to soften their unpleasant image. Reputation is a treasure to be carefully collected and hoarded, especially when you are first establishing it. You must protect it strictly, anticipating all attacks on it. Once it is solid, do not let yourself get angry or defensive at the slanderous comments of your enemies that reveals insecurity, not confidence in your reputation. Take the high road instead, and never appear desperate in your self-defense. On the other hand, an attack on another man's reputation is a potent weapon, particularly when you have less power than he does. He has much more to lose in such a battle, and your own thus far small reputation gives him a small target when he tries to return your fire. Barnum used such campaigns to great effect in his early career, but this tactic must be practiced with skill. You must not seem to engage in petty vengeance. If you do not break your enemy's reputation cleverly, you will inadvertently ruin your own. Thomas Edison, considered the inventor who harnessed electricity, believed that a workable system would have to be based on direct current. DC. When the Serbian scientist Nikola Tesla appeared to have succeeded in creating a system based on alternating current, AC, Edison was furious. He determined to ruin Tesla's reputation, by making the public believe that the AC system was inherently unsafe, and Tesla irresponsible in promoting it. To this end he captured all kinds of household pets and electrocuted them to death with an AC current. When this wasn't enough, in 1890 he got New York State prison authorities to organize the world's first execution by electrocution, using an AC current. But Edison's electrocution experiments had all been with small creatures. The charge was too weak, and the man was only half killed. In perhaps the country's cruelest state authorized execution, the procedure had to be repeated. It was an awful spectacle. Although, in the long run, it is Edison's name that has survived, at the time his campaign damaged his own reputation more than Tesla's. He backed off. The lesson is simple never go too far in attacks like these, for that will draw more attention to your own vengefulness than to the person you are slandering. When your own reputation is solid, use subtler tactics, such as satire and ridicule, to weaken your opponent while making you out as a charming rogue. The mighty lion toys with a mouse that crosses his path. Any other reaction would mar his fearsome reputation. Image. A mind full of diamonds and rubies. You dug for it, you found it, and your wealth is now assured. Guard it with your life. Robbers and thieves will appear from all sides. Never take your wealth for granted, and constantly renew it. Time will diminish the jewel's luster, and bury them from sight. Authority. Therefore I should wish our courtier to bolster up his inherent worth with skill and cunning, and ensure that whenever he has to go where he is a stranger, 
he is preceded by a good reputation for the fame which appears to rest on the opinions of many fosters a certain unshakable belief in a man's worth which is then easily strengthened in minds already thus disposed and prepared. Balder sarcastically in 1478 to 1529 reversal there is no possible reversal reputation is critical there are no exceptions to this law perhaps not caring what others think of you you gain a reputation for insolence and arrogance but that can be a valuable image in itself Oscar Wilde used it to great advantage since we must live in society and must depend on the opinions of others there is nothing to be gained by neglecting your reputation by not caring how you are perceived you let others decide this for you. Be the master of your fate, and also of your reputation. Law 6. Court attention at all cost. Judgment. Everything is judged by its appearance. What is unseen counts for nothing. Never let yourself get lost in the crowd, then, or buried in oblivion. Stand out. Be conspicuous, at all cost. Make yourself a magnet of attention by appearing larger, more colorful, more mysterious than the bland and timid masses. Part 1. Surround your name with the sensational and scandalous. Draw attention to yourself by creating an unforgettable, even controversial image. Court scandal. Do anything to make yourself seem larger than life and shine more brightly than those around you. Make no distinction between kinds of attention. Notoriety of any sort will bring you power. Better to be slandered and attacked than ignored. Observance of the law. P.T. Barnum, America's premier 19th century showman, started his career as an assistant to the owner of a circus, Aaron Turner. In 1836 the circus stopped in Annapolis, Maryland, for a series of performances. On the morning of opening day, Barnum took a stroll through town, wearing a new black suit. People started to follow him. Someone in the gathering crowd shouted out that he was the Reverend Ephraim K. Avery, infamous as a man acquitted of the charge of murder but still believed guilty by most Americans. The angry mob tore off Barnum's suit and was ready to lynch him. After desperate appeals, Barnum finally convinced them to follow him to the circus, where he could verify his identity. The Wasp and the Prince, a wasp named Pintail was long in quest of some deed that would make him forever famous. So one day he entered the K.I.R.U.G.'s palace and stung the little prince, who was in bed. The prince awoke with loud cries. The king and his courtiers rushed in to see what had happened. The prince was yelling as the wasp stung him again and again. The courtiers tried to catch the wasp, and each in turn was stung. The whole royal household rushed in, the news soon spread and people flocked to the palace. The city was in an uproar, all business suspended, said the wasp to itself, before it expired from its efforts, a name without fame is like fire without flame. There is nothing like attracting notice at any cost. Indian fable once there, old Turner confirmed that this was all a practical joke. He himself had spread the rumor that Barnum was Avery. The crowd dispersed, but Barnum, who had nearly been killed, was not amused. He wanted to know what could have induced his boss to play such a trick. My dear Mr. Barnum, Turner replied, it was all for our good. Remember, all we need to ensure success is notoriety. And indeed everyone in town was talking about the joke, and the circus was packed that night and every night it stayed in Annapolis. Barnum had learned a lesson he would never forget. Barnum's first big venture of his own was the American Museum, a collection of curiosities, located in New York. One day a beggar approached Barnum in the street. Instead of giving him money, Barnum decided to employ him. Taking him back to the museum, he gave the man five bricks and told him to make a slow circuit of several blocks. At certain points he was to lay down a brick on the sidewalk, always keeping one brick in hand. On the return journey he was to replace each brick on the street with the one he held. Meanwhile he was to remain serious of countenance and to answer no questions. Once back at the museum, he was to enter, walk around inside, then leave through the back door and make the same brick laying circuit again. On the man's first walk through the streets, several hundred people watched his mysterious movements. By his fourth circuit, Onlookers swarmed around him, debating what he was doing. Every time he entered the museum he was followed by people who bought tickets to keep watching him. Many of them were distracted by the museum's collections, and stayed inside. By the end of the first day, the brick man had drawn over a thousand people into the museum. A few days later the police ordered him to cease and desist from his walks. The crowds were blocking traffic. The brick lane stopped but thousands of New Yorkers had entered the museum, and many of those had become P. T. Barnum converts. Even when I'm railed at, I get my quota of renown. Petro Oretano, 
1492-1556, Barnum would put a band of musicians on a balcony overlooking the street, beneath a huge banner proclaiming free music for the millions. What generosity, New Yorkers thought, and they flocked to hear the free concerts. But Barnum took pains to hire the worst musicians he could find, and soon after the band struck up, people would hurry to buy tickets to the museum, where they would be out of earshot of the band's noise and of the booing of the crowd. The court artist, a work that was voluntarily presented to a prince was bound to seem in some way special. The artist himself might also try to attract the attention of the court through his behavior. In Becerra's judgment, Sodoma was well known both for his personal eccentricities and for his reputation as a good painter. Because Pope Leo X found pleasure in such strange, hair-brained individuals, he made Sodoma a knight causing the artist to go completely out of his mind. Van Mander found it odd that the products of Cornelis Gtol's experiments in mouth and foot painting were bought by notable persons because of their oddity, yet Gtol was only adding a variation to similar experiments by Titian, Hugo da Carpi and Palma Jivan, who, according to Boschini painted with their fingers because they wished to imitate the method used by the supreme creator. Van Manda reports that Gossard attracted the attention of Emperor Charles by wearing a fantastic paper costume. In doing so he was adopting the tactics used by Dinocrates, who, in order to gain access to Alexander the Great, is said to have appeared disguised as the naked Hercules when the monarch was sitting in judgment. The court artist, Martin Wark, 1993 One of the first oddities Barnum toured around the country was Joyce Hare, a woman he claimed was 161 years old, and whom he advertised as a slave who had once been George Washington's nurse. After several months the crowds began to dwindle, so Barnum sent an anonymous letter to the papers, claiming that Heth was a clever fraud. Joyce Hare, he wrote, is not a human being but an automaton, made up of whalebone, India rubber, and numberless springs. Those who had not bothered to see her before were immediately curious, and those who had already seen her paid to see her again, to find out whether the rumor that she was a robot was true. In 1842, Barnum purchased the carcass of what was purported to be a mermaid. This creature resembled a monkey with the body of a fish, but the head and body were perfectly joined. It was truly a wonder. After some research Barnum discovered that the creature had been expertly put together in Japan, where the hoax had caused quite a stir. He nevertheless planted articles in newspapers around the country claiming the capture of a mermaid in the Fiji Islands. He also sent the papers would cut prints of paintings showing mermaids. By the time he showed the specimen in his museum, a national debate had been sparked over the existence of these mythical creatures. A few months before Barnum's campaign, no one had cared or even known about mermaids. Now everyone was talking about them as if they were real. Crowds flocked in record numbers to see the Fiji mermaid, and to hear debates on the subject. A few years later, Barnum toured Europe with General Tom Thumb, a five-year-old dwarf from Connecticut whom Barnum claimed was an 11-year-old English boy, and whom he had trained to do many remarkable acts. During this tour Barnum's name attracted such attention that Queen Victoria, that paragon of sobriety, requested a private audience with him and his talented dwarf at Buckingham Palace. The English press may have ridiculed Barnum, but Victoria was royally entertained by him, and respected him ever after. Interpretation Barnum understood the fundamental truth about attracting attention, once people's eyes are on you, you have a special legitimacy. For Barnum, creating interest meant creating a crowd. As he later wrote, every crowd has a silver lining and crowds tend to act in conjunction. If one person stops to see your big garment laying bricks in the street, more will do the same. They will gather like dust bunnies. Then, given a gentle push, they will enter your museum or watch your show. To create a crowd you have to do something different and odd. Any kind of curiosity will serve the purpose, for crowds are magnetically attracted by the unusual and inexplicable. As once you have their attention, never let it go. If it veers toward other people, it does so at your expense. Barnum would ruthlessly suck attention from his competitors, knowing what a valuable commodity it is. At the beginning of your rise to the top, then, spend all your energy on attracting attention. Most important, the quality of the attention is irrelevant. No matter how badly his shows were reviewed, or how slanderously personal were the attacks on his hoaxes, Barnum would never complain. If a newspaper critic reviled him particularly badly, in fact, he made sure to invite the man to an opening and to give him the best seat in the house. He would even write anonymous attacks on his own work, 
just to keep his name in the papers. From Barnum's vantage, attention whether negative or positive was the main ingredient of his success. The worst fate in the world for a man who yearns fame, glory, and, of course, power is to be ignored. If the courtier happens to engage in arms in some public spectacle such as jousting, he will ensure that the horse he is is beautifully caparisoned, that he himself is suitably attired, with appropriate mottos and ingenious devices to attract the eyes of the onlookers in his direction as surely as the lodestone attracts iron. Baldur Sir Castigo, 1478-1529 Keys to power Burning more brightly than those around you is a skill that no one is born with. You have to learn to attract attention, as surely as the lodestone attracts iron. At the start of your career, you must attach your name and reputation to a quality, an image, that sets you apart from other people. This image can be something like a characteristic style of dress, or a personality quirk that amuses people and gets talked about. Once the image is established, you have an appearance, a place in the sky for your star. It is a common mistake to imagine that this peculiar appearance of yours should not be controversial, that to be attacked is somehow bad. Nothing could be further from the truth. To avoid being a flash in the pan, and having your notoriety eclipsed by another, you must not discriminate between different types of attention. In the end, every kind will work in your favor. Barnum, we have seen, welcomed personal attacks and felt no need to defend himself. He deliberately courted the image of being a humbug. The court of Louis XIV contained many talented writers, artists, great beauties, and men and women of impeccable virtue, but no one was more talked about than the singular Duc de Lausanne. The Duke was short, almost dwarfish, and he was prone to the most insolent kinds of behavior. He slept with the king's mistress, and openly insulted not only other courtiers but the king himself. Louis, however, was so beguiled by the duke's eccentricities that he could not bear his absences from the court. It was simple, the strangeness of the duke's character attracted attention. Once people were enthralled by him, they wanted him around at any cost. Society craves larger than life figures, people who stand above the general mediocrity. Never be afraid then, of the qualities that set you apart and draw attention to you. Court controversy, even scandal. It is better to be attacked, even slandered, than ignored. All professions are ruled by this law, and all professionals must have a bit of the showman about them. The great scientist Thomas Edison knew that to raise money he had to remain in the public eye at any cost. Almost as important as the inventions themselves was how he presented them to the public and courted attention. Edison would design visually dazzling experiments to display his discoveries with electricity. He would talk of future inventions that seemed fantastic at the time robots, and machines that could photograph thought and that he had no intention of wasting his energy on, but that made the public talk about him. He did everything he could to make sure that he received more attention than his great rival Nikola Tesla, who may actually have been more brilliant than he was but whose name was far less known. In 1915, it was rumored that Edison and Tesla would be joint recipients of that year's Nobel Prize in Physics. The prize was eventually given to a pair of English physicists. Only later was it discovered that the prize committee had actually approached Edison, but he had turned them down, refusing to share the prize with Tesla. By that time his fame was more secure than Tesla's, and he thought it better to refuse the honor than to allow his rival the attention that would have come even from sharing the prize. If you find yourself in a lowly position that offers little opportunity for you to draw attention, an effective trick is to attack the most visible, most famous, most powerful person you can find. When Pietro Oretano, a young Roman servant boy of the early 16th century, wanted to get attention as a writer of verses, he decided to publish a series of satirical poems ridiculing the Pope and his affection for a pet elephant. The attack put a retino in the public eye immediately. A slanderous attack on a person in a position of power would have a similar effect. Remember, however, to use such tactics sparingly after you have the public's attention, when the act can wear thin. Once in the limelight you must constantly renew it by adapting and varying your method of courting attention. If you don't, the public will grow tired, will take you for granted, and will move on to a newer star. The game requires constant vigilance and creativity. Pablo Picasso never allowed himself to fade into the background. If his name became too attached to a particular style, he would deliberately upset the public with a new series of paintings that went against all expectations. Better to create something ugly and disturbing, he believed, than to let viewers grow too familiar with his work. Understand. 
people feel superior to the person whose actions they can predict. If you show them who is in control by playing against their expectations, you both gain their respect and tighten your hold on their fleeting attention. Image the limelight. The actor who steps into this brilliant light attains a heightened presence. All eyes are on him. There is room for only one actor at a time in the limelight's narrow beam. Do whatever it takes to make yourself its focus. Make your gestures so large, amazing, and scandalous that the light stays on you while the other actors are left in the shadows. Authority. Be ostentatious and be seen. What is not seen is as though it did not exist. It was light that first caused all creation to shine forth. Display fills up many blanks, covers up deficiencies, and gives everything a second life, especially when it is backed by genuine merit. Voltaire's Outration, 1601 to 1658. Part 2, Create an Air of Mystery. In a world growing increasingly banal and familiar, what seems enigmatic instantly draws attention. Never make it too clear what you are doing or about to do. Do not show all your cards. An air of mystery heightens your presence. It also creates anticipation everyone will be watching you to see what happens next. Use mystery to beguile, seduce, even frighten. Observance of the law. Beginning in 1905, rumors started to spread throughout Paris of a young oriental girl who danced in a private home wrapped in veils that she gradually discarded. A local journalist who had seen her dancing reported that a woman from the Far East had come to Europe laden with perfume and jewels, to introduce some of the richness of the Oriental color and life into the satiated society of European cities. Soon everyone knew the dancer's name, Marta Hari. Early that year, in the winter, small and select audiences would gather in a salon filled with Indian statues and other relics while an orchestra played music inspired by Hindu and Javanese melodies. After keeping the audience waiting and wondering, Marta Hari would suddenly appear, in a startling costume, a white cotton brassiere covered with Indian-type jewels. Jeweled bands at the waist supporting a sarong that revealed as much as it concealed, bracelets up the arms. Then Marta Hari would dance, in a style no one in France had seen before, her whole body swaying as if she were in a trance. She told her excited and curious audience that her dances told stories from Indian mythology and Javanese folk tales. Soon the cream of Paris, and ambassadors from far-off lands, were competing for invitations to the salon, where it was rumored that Marta Hari was actually performing sacred dances in the nude. The public wanted to know more about her. She told journalists that she was actually Dutch in origin, but had grown up on the island of Java. She would also talk about time spent in India, how she had learned sacred Hindi dances there, and how Indian women can shoot straight, ride horseback, and are capable of doing logarithms and talk philosophy. By the summer of 1905, although few Parisians had actually seen Marta Hari dance, her name was on everyone's lips. As Marta Hari gave more interviews, the story of her origins kept changing. She had grown up in India, her grandmother was the daughter of a Javanese princess, she had lived on the island of Sumatra where she had spent her time horseback riding, gun in hand, and risking her life. No one knew anything certain about her. But journalists did not mind these changes in her biography. They compared her to an Indian goddess, a creature from the pages of Baudelaire whatever their imagination wanted to see in this mysterious woman from the East. In August of 1905, Marta Hari performed for the first time in public. Crowds thronging to see her on opening night caused a riot. She had now become a cult figure, spawning many imitations. One reviewer wrote, Marta Hari personifies all the poetry of India, its mysticism, its voluptuousness, its hypnotizing charm. Another noted, if India possesses such unexpected treasures, then all Frenchmen will emigrate to the shores of the Ganges. Soon the fame of Marta Hari and her sacred Indian dances spread beyond Paris. She was invited to Berlin, Vienna, Milan. Over the next few years she performed throughout Europe, mixed with the highest social circles, and earned an income that gave her an independence rarely enjoyed by a woman of the period. Then, near the end of World War I, she was arrested in France, tried, convicted, and finally executed as a German spy. Only during the trial did the truth come out. Marta Hari was not from Java or India, had not grown up in the Orient, did not have a drop of Eastern blood in her body. Her real name was Margaretha Zelle, and she came from the stolid northern province of Friesland, Holland. Interpretation When Margaretha Zelle -E arrived in Paris, 
In 1904, she had half a franc in her pocket. She was one of the thousands of beautiful young girls who flocked to Paris every year, taking work as artists, models, nightclub dancers, or vaudeville performers at the Folies Burger. After a few years they would inevitably be replaced by younger girls, and would often end up on the streets, turning to prostitution, or else returning to the town they came from. Older and chastened, Z.E.L.L.E. had higher ambitions. She had no dance experience and had never performed in the theatre, but as a young girl she had travelled with her family and had witnessed local dances in Java and Sumatra. Z.E.L.L.E. clearly understood that what was important in her act was not the dance itself, or even her face or figure, but her ability to create an air of mystery about herself. The mystery she created lay not just in her dancing, or her costumes or the stories she would tell, or her endless lies about her origins. It lay in an atmosphere enveloping everything she did. There was nothing you could say for sure about her. She was always changing, always surprising her audience with new costumes, new dances, new stories. This air of mystery left the public always wanting to know more, always wondering about her next move. Marta Hari was no more beautiful than many of the other young girls who came to Paris, and she was not a particularly good dancer. What separated her from the mass, what attracted and held the public's attention and made her famous and wealthy, was her mystery. People are enthralled by mystery. Because it invites constant interpretation, they never tire of it. The mysterious cannot be grasped, and what cannot be seized and consumed creates power. Keys to power. In the past, the world was filled with the terrifying and unknowable diseases, disasters, capricious despots, the mystery of death itself. What we could not understand we reimagined as myths and spirits. Over the centuries, though, we have managed, through science and reason, to illuminate the darkness. What was mysterious and forbidding has grown familiar and comfortable. Yet this light has a price, in a world that is ever more banal, that has had its mystery and myth squeezed out of it. We secretly crave enigmas, people or things that cannot be instantly interpreted, seized and consumed. That is the power of the mysterious, it invites layers of interpretation, excites our imagination, seduces us into believing that it conceals something marvelous. The world has become so familiar and its inhabitants so predictable that what wraps itself in mystery will almost always draw the limelight to it and make us watch it. Do not imagine that to create an air of mystery you have to be grand and awe inspiring. Mystery that is woven into your day-to-day -day demeanor, and is subtle, has that much more power to fascinate and attract attention. Remember, most people are upfront, can be read like an open book, take little care to control their words or image, and are hopelessly predictable. By simply holding back, keeping silent, occasionally uttering ambiguous phrases, deliberately appearing inconsistent, and acting odd in the subtlest of ways, you will emanate an aura of mystery. The people around you will then magnify that aura by constantly trying to interpret you. Both artists and con artists understand the vital link between being mysterious and attracting interest. Count Victor Lustig, the aristocrat of swindlers, played the game to perfection. He was always doing things that were different, or seemed to make no sense. He would show up at the best hotels in a limo driven by a Japanese chauffeur. No one had ever seen a Japanese chauffeur before, so this seemed exotic and strange. Lustig would dress in the most expensive clothing, but always with something a medal, a flower, an armband out of place, at least in conventional terms. This was seen not as tasteless but as odd and intriguing. In hotels he would be seen receiving telegrams at all hours, one after the other, brought to him by his Japanese chauffeur telegrams he would tear up without a nonchalance. In fact they were fakes, completely blank. He would sit alone in the dining room, reading a large and impressive looking book, smiling at people yet remaining aloof. Within a few days, of course, the entire hotel would be abuzz with interest in this strange man. All this attention allowed Lustig to lure suckers in with ease. They would beg for his confidence and his company. Everyone wanted to be seen with this mysterious aristocrat, and in the presence of this distracting enigma, they wouldn't even notice that they were being robbed blind. An air of mystery can make the mediocre appear intelligent and profound. It made Marta Hari, a woman of average appearance and intelligence, seem like a goddess, and her dancing divinely inspired. An air of mystery about an artist makes his or her artwork immediately more intriguing, a trick Marcel Duchamp played to great effect. It is all very easy to do say little about your work, tease and titillate with alluring, even contradictory comments. 
Then stand back and let others try to make sense of it all. Mysterious people put others in a kind of inferior position that of trying to figure them out. To degrees that they can control, they also elicit the fear surrounding anything uncertain or unknown. All great leaders know that an aura of mystery draws attention to them and creates an intimidating presence. Mao Tse Tung, for example, cleverly cultivated an enigmatic image. He had no worries about seeming inconsistent or contradicting himself. The very contradictoriness of his actions and words meant that he always had the upper hand. No one, not even his own wife, ever felt they understood him, and he therefore seemed larger than life. This also meant that the puppet paid constant attention to him, ever anxious to witness his next move. If your social position prevents you from completely wrapping your actions in mystery, you must at least learn to make yourself less obvious every now and then act in a way that does not mesh with other people's perception of you. This way you keep those around you on the defensive, eliciting the kind of attention that makes you powerful. Done right, the creation of Enigma can also draw the kind of attention that strikes terror into your enemy. During the Second Punic War, 219-202 BC, the great Carthaginian general Hannibal was wreaking havoc in his march on Rome. Hannibal was known for his cleverness and duplicity. Under his leadership Carthage's army, though smaller than those of the Romans, had constantly outmaneuvered them. On one occasion, though, Hannibal's scouts made a horrible blunder, leading his troops into a marshy terrain with the sea at their back. The Roman army blocked the mountain passes that led inland, and its general, Fablos, was ecstatic at last he had Hannibal trapped. Posting his best sentries on the passes, he worked on a plan to destroy Hannibal's forces. But in the middle of the night, the sentries looked down to see a mysterious sight, a huge procession of lights was heading up the mountain, thousands and thousands of lights. If this was Hannibal's army, it had suddenly grown a hundredfold. The sentries argued heatedly about what this could mean, reinforcements from the sea, troops that had been hidden in the area, ghosts. No explanation made sense. As they watched, fires broke out all over the mountain, and a horrible noise drifted up to them from below, like the blowing of a million horns. Demons, they thought. The sentries, the bravest and most sensible in the Roman army, fled their posts in a panic. By the next day, Hannibal had escaped from the marshland. What was his trick? Had he really conjured up demons? Actually what he had done was order bundles of twigs to be fastened to the horns of the thousands of oxen that traveled with his troops as beasts of burden. The twigs were then lit giving the impression of the torches of a vast army heading up the mountain. When the flames burned down to the oxen skin, they stampeded in all directions, bellowing like mad and setting fires all over the mountainside. The key to this device's success was not the torches, the fires, or the noises in themselves, however, but the fact that Hannibal had created a puzzle that captivated the sentry's attention and gradually terrified them. From the mountain top there was no way to explain this bizarre sight. If the sentries could have explained it they would have stayed at their posts. If you find yourself trapped, cornered, and on the defensive in some situation, try a simple experiment, do something that cannot be easily explained or interpreted. Choose a simple action, but carry it out in a way that unsettles your opponent away with many possible interpretations, making your intentions obscure. Don't just be unpredictable, although this tactic too can be successful. See Law 17. Like Hannibal, create a scene that cannot be read. There will seem to be no method to your madness, no rhyme or reason, no single explanation. If you do this right, you will inspire fear and trembling and the sentries will abandon their posts. Call it the feigned madness of Hamlet tactic, for Hamlet uses it to great effect in Shakespeare's play, frightening his stepfather Claudius through the mystery of his behavior. The mysterious makes your forces seem larger, your power more terrifying. Image. The dance of the veils. The veils envelop the dancer. What they reveal causes excitement. What they conceal heightens interest. The essence of mystery. Authority. If you do not declare yourself immediately, you arouse expectation. Mix a little mystery with everything, and the very mystery stirs up veneration. And when you explain, be not too explicit. In this manner you imitate the divine way when you cause men to wonder and watch. Voltaire's Agration, 1601-1658. Reversal. In the beginning of your rise to the top, you must attract attention at all cost. But as you rise higher you must constantly adapt. Never wear the public out with the same tactic. An air of mystery works wonders for those who need to develop an aura of power and get themselves noticed, 
but it must seem measured and under control. Marta Hari went too far with her fabrications. Although the accusation that she was a spy was false, at the time it was a reasonable presumption because all her lies made her seem suspicious and nefarious. Do not let your air of mystery be slowly transformed into a reputation for deceit. The mystery you create must seem again, playful and unthreatening. Recognize when it goes too far, and pull back. There are times when the need for attention must be deferred, and when scandal and notoriety are the last things you want to create. The attention you attract must never offend or challenge the reputation of those above you not, at any rate, if they are secure. You will seem not only paltry but desperate by comparison. There is an art to knowing when to draw notice and when to withdraw. Lola Montes was one of the great practitioners of the art of attracting attention. She managed to rise from a middle-class Irish background to being the lover of Franz Liszt and then the mistress and political advisor of King Ludwig of Bavaria. In her later years, though, she lost her sense of proportion. In London in 1850 there was to be a performance of Shakespeare's Macbeth featuring the greatest actor of the time, Charles John Keane. Everyone of consequence in English society was to be there. It was rumored that even Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were to make a public appearance. The custom of the period demanded that everyone be seated before the Queen arrived. So the audience got there a little early, and when the Queen entered her royal box, they observed the convention of standing up and applauding her. The royal couple waited, then bowed. Everyone sat down and the lights were dimmed. Then, suddenly, all eyes turned to a box opposite Queen Victoria's. A woman appeared from the shadows, taking her seat later than the Queen. It was Lola Montes. She wore a diamond tiara on her dark hair and a long fur coat over her shoulders. People whispered in amazement as the ermine cloak was dropped to reveal a low neck gown of crimson velvet. By turning their heads, the audience could see that the royal couple deliberately avoided looking at Lola's box. They followed Victoria's example, and for the rest of the evening Lola Montes was ignored. After that evening no one in fashionable society dared to be seen with her. All her magnetic powers were reversed. People would flee her sight. Her future in England was finished. Never appear overly greedy for attention, then, for it signals insecurity and insecurity drives power away. Understand that there are times when it is not in your interest to be the center of attention. When in the presence of the king or queen, for instance, or the equivalent thereof, bow and retreat to the shadows. Never compete. Law 7. Get others to do the work for you, but always take the credit. Judgment. Use the wisdom, knowledge, and legwork of other people to further your own cause. Not only will such assistance save you valuable time and energy, it will give you a godlike aura of efficiency and speed. In the end your helpers will be forgotten and you will be remembered. Never do yourself what others can do for you. Transgression and observance of the law. In 1883 a young Serbian scientist named Nikola Tesla was working for the European division of the Continental Edison Company. He was a brilliant inventor, and Charles Batchelor, a plant manager and a personal friend friend of Thomas Edison, persuaded him he should seek his fortune in America, giving him a letter of introduction to Edison himself. So began a life of woe and tribulation that lasted until Tesla's death. One day the tortoise met the elephant, who trumpeted, out of my way, you weakling I might step on you. The tortoise was not afraid and stayed where he was, so the elephant stepped on him, but could not crush him. Do not boast, Mr. Elephant, I am as strong as you are said the tortoise, but the elephant just laughed. So the tortoise asked him to come to his hill the next morning. The next day, before sunrise, the tortoise ran down the hill to the river, where he met the hippopotamus, who was just on his way back into the water after his nocturnal feeding. Mr. Hippo, shall we have a tug of war? I bet I'm as strong as you are, said the tortoise. The hippopotamus laughed at this ridiculous idea. But agreed. The tortoise produced a long rope and told the hippo to hold it in his mouth until the tortoise shouted hey. Then the tortoise ran back up the hill where he found the elephant, who was getting impatient. He gave the elephant the other end of the rope and said, when I say hey, pull, and you'll see which of us is the strongest. Then he ran halfway back down the hill, to a place where he couldn't be seen, and shouted, hey. The elephant and the hippopotamus pulled and pulled but neither could budge the other they were of equal strength. They both agreed that the tortoise was as strong as they were. Never do what others can do for you. The tortoise let others do the work for him while he got the credit. Zairean fable when Tesla met Edison in New York. The famous inventor hired him on the spot. Tesla worked 18-hour days, 
finding ways to improve the primitive Edison dynamos. Finally he offered to redesign them completely. To Edison this seemed a monumental task that could last years without paying off, but he told Tesla, there's $50,000 in it for you if you can do it. Tesla labored day and night on the project and after only a year he produced a greatly improved version of the dynamo, complete with automatic controls. He went to Edison to break the good news and receive his $50,000. Edison was pleased with the improvement, for which he and his company would take credit, but when it came to the issue of the money he told the young Serb, Tesla, you don't understand our American humor and offered a small raise instead. Tesla's obsession was to create an alternating current system, AC, of electricity. Edison believed in the direct current system, DC, and not only refused to support Tesla's research but later did all he could to sabotage him. Tesla turned to the great Pittsburgh magnet George Westinghouse, who had started his own electricity company. Westinghouse completely funded Tesla's research and offered him a generous royalty agreement on future profits.